Mr. Pawn Boss, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lust, the Palm Boss, coming at you live from a remote destination. I'm actually hanging out in New Mexico, hanging out just um, north of Ruidoso, New Mexico, at a cabin, and getting to spend a few days just uh, being alone, which I've kind of been looking forward to that. I see uh, Sean Peters looking, John Funk checking in, DeAndre Kimbrough. Good to see you guys. Uh just enjoy the setting back there. I'm I'm about, I'm probably going to say three miles north of Midtown, Rodoso, New Mexico. I've got a longtime client and, and good friend uh, from Midland, Odessa, Larry Hensley, who I've helped him with his lake near Brownwood, Texas for a long, long time. And he's got a cabin here. Hi, Ted Kirby, Justin Shank. Good to see you guys. Well, anyway, I was talking to him one day just a few months ago i see chuck angeloni checking in michael gray checking in from tennessee jose latore from florida good to see him so anyway i was talking to to him oh i don't know several months ago and he told me he was calling me from rudoso or oh no wait yeah no, he was gonna go to rudoso and i said oh really you got friends there he says no i got a cabin i said let's have a talk <laughs> maybe we could uh maybe we could figure out how we could um trade a little consulting work for a little bit of time in your cabin. So that's what I'm doing. So he was very receptive to that, as was I. So I'm, I'm getting to kind of hang out. So uh, look at there. There's Dr. Howard Dittrick checking in. Good to see you. We need to talk here before long. Troy Todd, Mike Crawford from North Carolina, Drew Bachman from South Carolina, Jacob West. Hey, you guys know the drill. Danny Mack, good to see you checking in. Um... You know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. Tag a friend or two. If you got a friend with a pond, tag them here as well. Click like, share this to your timeline, and you're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and a Pond Boss mug. Say it with me, Jacob, that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold as we build an audience. There's Trevor. Good to see Trevor. Katie Baca. Good to see Katie. Hey, 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 she says. She's probably been fishing lately. Matter of fact, I bet a hundred bucks she has. I'm gonna scroll down here. See who else we got going that I'm missing. Trevor Shot Jets checking in from uh, Joshua, Texas, near Fort Worth. Anyway, I, I was thinking about a topic for today and it was kind of coming up blank, but one thing that hit me that I really do think is important. Let's see, Gary Elborn, Ty Jackson, Jimmy Mitchell, Chad Roberts, good to see all you guys checking in. Um, one of the things that, as I get older and learn more about this stuff, how it all ties together is really amazing to me. So I thought I'd start off with that topic, how everything in nature is ties together, but much of what's in nature is a consequence. It's a consequence of a bunch of things that come together. You know, so I thought I'd talk about that till you guys start throwing a few questions at me. Michael Gregory, I see you here. Mike Cook, checking in. Boy Scouts from North Carolina, a top fan. I don't know how you get to be a top fan, but I like that little tag there. That's pretty cool. Um, and it, 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 this topic actually stemmed from a conversation that I had with the couple that bought Lusk Lodge, comma, two. And... They, they live in the city. They're both brilliant, brilliant people. Hey, Tracy Smith, good to see you. Travis Smith Jr., okay, I see what's going on there. Kenny, Kenny Sanderson checking in from northwestern Kansas. So it looks like we're representing the whole nation here, folks. I love that. So they're, uh, they're both physicians, and they're both highly intelligent, and they both have spent the majority of their lives being educated and then serving people. So what they haven't been able to do as much is learn how nature works. So uh, I spent several days in the cabin there a week or so ago, and they wanted to have a conversation. So I sat down with them, and uh, the wife, Jennifer, she asked me, she said, one thing I'm not quite wrapping my brain around is, is how all these things tie together. So I started visiting with her, and... Uh, 
talking about how all these all these things in nature come together. So I said, okay, look out over the pond. You see that water line. Underneath the water line is a variety of habitat. And the habitat that was designed for that pond, which is a swimming pond, by the way. <laughs> I know my wife is watching. So uh, she, she designed that to be a swimming pond. Ty Jackson, can I do a video call with you and get your advice on my pond? Sure, we can do that. Happy to do it. Let's see here. Um, okay, now I'm, something's happening to my computer. Tracy, oh, okay, I'll say I got it. Travis is using his sister's account. He's been punished from Facebook. You're in Facebook jail, Travis, are you? <laughs> well, good luck to you on that. Um, the, uh, uh, the thing I was telling her is, is that when you start looking below the waterline, like right now, I'm designing about six or seven different lakes around the nation. And one of the things that I've got one in, one in Iowa, one in, um, two in Missouri, I've got three in Texas, four in Oklahoma, and one maybe in southeastern Kansas or western Missouri. I'm not quite sure where that one's going to be. But one of the common bonds, the common threads that I'm seeing that folks really aren't understanding. How is the baby Lusk? I've been dying to ask for two weeks. <laughs> well, she's almost two months old, and she rolled over today. She's not even two months old yet. I got a video of her rolling over. She is a living doll, just a... Just just coos and talks and is just as pleasant, you know, and I guess I'm kind of partial, but pretty fun. Hi, Kim Moore. Good to see you. So, um, so what's, what's, what's going on with all these lakes that I'm trying to help guys understand and to see how this, how things work is, is you got to design the habitat for the different stages of the lives of the fish. So you got to have places for fish to spawn. You got to have places for fish to feed. You got to have places for fish to hide, to congregate, to loaf, travel paths. So in essence, what you're doing when you're designing the basin of a lake or a pond is you're trying to create the best habitat, the best structure, and turn it into an underwater community. Now, it's hard to do that because people don't really know how fish live as a community. Well, I've seen enough from the electrofishing boat and from lakes and ponds that I've drained and that I've built and that I get to see how the fish behave. You know, and, and got to know the majority of what I've learned about ponds and lakes and how fish behave, when I say behave, is where they are and how they congregate, how they cluster, how they're loners. It's all that has to do with what kind of habitat that they've got. If they've got that kind of habitat, then that's what they're going to do. Uh, I was talked to a guy here several weeks ago. I've talked about it on this show before. He actually drained his 20-acre lake because he was not able to, to, to get over the hump. Took After four years, he was still catching little bitty bass, 10 to 12-inch little bitty bass. You know, the difference between now and four years ago is that he's not catching as many. So even though he's culling the bass, he's not getting the growth rates that he needs. And when, when he drained that lake, it was clear. There were hundreds and hundreds of standing dead trees that was nothing left except just for, oh, I just heard a bugle elk. I mean, an elk bugle. That was pretty cool. Um, I saw a herd of them yesterday in town. That was pretty amazing. But what happened with this lake is the entire habitat is totally conducive to, uh, to growing small bass. There's, there, was, there was very little cover for bait fish and what cover he had for bait fish was so dense and so thick that they could get in it and not have to come out. You know, so as we started trying to figure this puzzle out, it when the water came off of it, it became clear. So when you've got the right elements of habitat that tie together to create an underwater community, the fishery is going to thrive. Now, that's from the water line down. So now, next time you're around your pond, I want you just to go look at it, especially ponds that have some maturity level. Look around the shoreline where you don't manicure it. Look around where you don't mow the grass. Look at all that. Take a look at those things. There's Christopher Aguilar checking in. I see him. Uh, and what you're going to find out is that, that your pond is influencing at least the top four or five different uh feet yeah four or five feet of 
of riparian or moist soil plants. You know, and so those plants influence the insect populations. Those plants influence the birds that come and live there. Then when you look up to look at it in levels. Okay, look at the bottom of the pond, look at the littoral zone of the pond, which is the edge that's above the thermocline, look through the water column, then look at the edge of the pond, then look at the next layer, then look at the next layer, then look at the next layer. All those layers tie together. And a lot of it starts with the water because you got insects growing in the water. I mean, if you've got a pond, you've got dragonflies. If you've got dragonflies, they're eating something. They're probably eating mosquitoes and gnats and small bugs is what they catch and eat. You know, so where I'm going with this is all these things tie together to create a community from the bottom of that pond and all the, all the things that are going on in the mud, you know, from the bacterial aerobic and anaerobic bacteria all the way up to the food chain, through the water column, through the habitat, and everything that's happening at those different levels are influenced or consequences by all that habitat. So in other words, what's living there is taking advantage of it. You're not going to see a camel in Alaska, and you're not going to see an alligator in Alaska, and you're not going to see a polar bear in Louisiana unless it's in a zoo. You know, and that's because that climate, that habitat, and everything that that animal needs is where they flourish. You know, so as pond managers and pond meisters, part of your job, part of your role is to help create that habitat that's most conducive for what your goals are because you're the one that's going to build the pond. You're the one that has the goals. You're the one that needs to figure out how to play the game. But what you have to understand is all this stuff ties together. And the way it ties together is going to be a direct influence on the consequences and the result of what you do to tie it together or what you don't do and don't tie it together. Billy Bates checking in from uh, Maryland. Let's see here. I'm going to look back down here. Looks like Katie's doing a little, putting some stuff up here. I see David Schneiderman checking in. Easy Doc, our good friend with Easy Doc of Texas. Check him out. Frank James from Louisiana. Jimmy Mitchell, a little off subject. Do you think if I cross a northern bobwhite with a Georgia giant bobwhite, it'll be a tiger bob? <laughs> That's a little off subject. Um... Okay, so Katie's putting some articles up. Mike McPherson from Indiana. Good to see you. That is a great view, isn't it? I just, I'm sitting there looking at it myself. I've been kind of in awe of it today. Uh, while I'm here, my goal, I've got several goals. And hey, you know what? You guys might play a role in one of these. Uh, I've written three books on different stuff about Palm Boss. Hello, Andy Eddings and John Gebhardt. Good to see you guys. Um, the first one I wrote was Basic Pond Management. That went to print three times. I wrote that one in 1993, and it's it's outdated. Uh, the second one I wrote was, I think, in 2001 or two. Actually, I wrote it right here in Rudoso, New Mexico. I wrote it in seven days. Had it in my mind for four years. Wrote it in seven days. And uh, that one's called Raising Trophy Bass. And another one I wrote about 10 or 12 years ago is um, uh, Perfect Pond, Want One. So what I've done is I've basically taken the concepts of the basic pond management handbook and expounded on it. And I've got all the text done, edited, proofread, ready to go. I'm picking out pictures. So I'm going to try to get that finished. I've got three chapters of that finished. Got four more to do. But here's where I'm going. I don't have a title for it. But it's going to be about pond management. So it's, it's going to be not basic, but not um, advanced. It's going to be somewhere in the middle. I'd love to have a title for it. I've been struggling for about a year and a half to think up a title for that dadgum book. But I'm going to finish it while I'm here, before I leave. And uh, it's going to go to layout. And I would sure love to hear if you guys have any thoughts about a a, a, a name for it. Send me an, in, in, send me an email to info at pondboss.com. That way Leanne can see it too. Look at there, James Allen from Kentucky. Mike Cottrell checking in. Andy Eddings. Good to see Andy. Saw Andy, Andy a while ago. James Allen. Christopher Aguilar. Traveling to Alaska at the end of October. That's a great place to go. Hello, Drew Hay. Checking in from Pennsylvania. Andy Felix. His first Pond Boss on Facebook Live. Good to have you, Andy. Let's see here. Kevin from Erie, Michigan. Tracy. Okay, there we go. We've got it. Um, Billy Bates. Bob, if you had to pick 
the perfect forage for your trophy largemouth bass pond, what would you look, what would that look like? And what percentages of what different forage species would it consist of? Um, I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like diversity. The bluegill sunfish are going to be the backbone of the food chain. Of course, Billy, you're up in Maryland, so we're going to talk a little bit differently there. If you're if you're influenced more by the Atlantic Ocean breezes and and you're you're not subjected to long spans of frigid weather, I'm I'm still going to tell you bluegill are going to be the backbone of the food chain. And with that, you know, in in up above the Mason Dixon line, north of the Mason Dixon line, they may spawn three times, but when you get further north, they're going to spawn fewer times. And but in the south, southeast, southwest, midwest, uh, in Texas, for example, bluegill will spawn five to six times, depending on what part of the region of the state and what kind of water you got. You get up in Oklahoma, they'll spawn three or four times. You get to Kansas, three times, maybe four times. You get to Nebraska twice maybe three times so that's the first that's the first thing I'd, I'd love to have bluegills as the backbone of the food chain uh fathead minnows jump start a new pond i don't recommend fathead minnows in an existing pond because they can't get, they can't reestablish. so uh fathead minnows jump start a new pond bluegill to the backbone of the food chain red ear sunfish are a good insurance policy they spawn once maybe twice and they do it in the same nest as bluegills but at a different temperature or a different phase of the moon, you know? So that's how God keeps them totally from interbreeding all the time. And you wind up with a bunch of hybrids. Uh, they will hybridize, but it's rare. It's usually because a male red ear found a nest that he could go fertilize a few eggs in while the, the daddy bluegill was fighting off the other comers. So that's kind of how that works. Another choice I would look at, uh, especially in the Northern tier of States are pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds play a similar role as do, um, uh, red ear sunfish do. So now in the South, threadfin shad are a go-to. They're a go-to for raising trophy largemouth bass. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. Threadfin shad are going to die at 42 degrees. So there's other similar fish, as long as they're native to your region where you are, had a gnat fly on my nose, uh, that work just like threadfin shad, and they don't get very big. Now, if I'm truly, truly going to manage for trophy bass, once the the bass mass gets to be where at least 25% of them are 18 inches and longer and bigger, where they have a big enough mouth, then I'll use gizzard shad. Now, gizzard shad are a little controversial when you start talking to biologists, but I'll tell you this. I don't have a trophy bass lake under management anywhere that does not have gizzard shad in it. But the timing of the stocking of those gizzard shad is a big deal. And that's because they get so big. They'll get to be two, two and a half pounds. You know, so there's, there's other choices like in upstate New York, we used white suckers up there to help grow eight pound bass. And those suckers, we, we, were, we were hatching them in a lab setting in McDonald jars. But suckers, I think, are fantastic bass food. You know, over at the Richmond Mill Lake near Laurenburg, North Carolina, that lake's naturally got suckers in it. And the suckers were helping clean up the fish food after it had been eaten by the other fish, you know, so they provided a good natural source of food. Uh, golden shiners can be a useful forage fish. But here's the bottom line. If you're going to try to grow trophy bass, diversifying your food chain and filling each niche in your pond. Now think about what I was talking about, what I was talking about a while ago is how all this stuff ties together. In your pond, you've got a variety of niches. You've got the littoral zone, which is that area around where the plants grow that sits above the thermocline. All of that is around the edges. Okay, then you've got open water. You know, you, and you've got fish that live in there. You've got fish that, like uh, threadfin shad, hybrid stripers, which that's a game fish, but they love open water. They'll go out in open water. So you've got several different niches. And when you have your habitat laid out, each one of your communities that you create brings its own micro niche. So if you've got a big log going off the shore back here, you know, and two brush piles beside it and some root ball stumps clustered together to create habitat for bait fish, now you've got niches where uh, bait fish can grow. And then surrounding that, you've got areas where intermediate sized bass can congregate and wait for some of those bait fish to come out. And then you got that big log where that six pound bass is waiting for a 12 inch bass to make the wrong move so he can eat that or she can eat that, you know? And so 
I think that's the way that you need to look at raising trophy bass. Howard Dittrich, can I put 10 pounds of shad in minnows in a one-acre pond filled with brim and bass, or just minnows alone? Um, you know, Howard, you've got a place, as I recall, in Tennessee and one in Florida. I think in northern Tennessee, where you are, that that threadfin shad would probably live one winter out of three, one winter out of four. They could be worth the buck, the bang for the buck, if you do it early in the spring. Um, now, when you when you put minnows in it, depending on what kind of minnows you choose, if you put fatheads in there, that's that's really wasting money because they don't stand any chance to perpetuate. And you're going to pay ten bucks a pound for those things. And remember, it takes 10 pounds of bait fish for a bass or a, well, at any trophic level of the food chain. It takes 10 pounds of live food to gain one pound of whatever's eating it. You know, and so um, can I put 10 pounds of shad and minnows in one in one acre pond filled with brim and bass? Yes, you can, uh, depending on what kind of shad and which pond it is. Is it in Florida or is it in, in Tennessee? That makes a difference. Yep. Um, let's see. Cliff Allen, wish I could fish, wish I could pond fish with my dad one more time. Boy, I, I know what you're talking about there. Uh, I've not told this backstory and I, I will. Um, Dave Weber says, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know or don't, don't pay the dumb tax. Read this book. <laughs> Bob would make a good Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. Maybe in South Louisiana, I might. <laughs> Um, just a little bit about my backstory. When, when I was 14 years old, my parents, uh, it, 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 up until about 1967, we were pretty poor. We lived in a, in a four room house called a shotgun house on two acres of land and had a Creek in the back. And we called those two acres the back 40. And I love to go play in that Creek and go outdoors and we didn't have a TV, but we had a radio, and every Tuesday, my grandmother would come get us, and we'd go to the library and check out books. I could not wait to get back and read those books, and, and every once in a while, my dad would bring a newspaper home from work, and I loved reading the outdoor section of the newspaper. Well, things got better, and in uh, August of 1969, my parents bought eight acres on the Brazos River down below Lake Granberry, west of Fort Worth, southwest of Fort Worth. Well, that was the year they impounded Lake Granberry. And so we got to drive around in the basin of that lake and before it ever filled up with water. You know, and today there's still dead pecan trees sticking up that I remember 50 whatever years ago, however long ago that was, but 48, 50 years ago, whenever they were alive. And I remember, I remember that. Well, as I traipsed up and down that river as a teenager for the next three or four years, that's where I made up my mind I was going to make a living messing with fish. And so, you know, when I graduated high school, my dad was in the real estate business at that time with my grandmother, his mother-in-law, and they both decided I needed to be in the real estate business. So I earned a, a, a scholarship to Tarrant County Junior College, went two and a half years, got a degree in real estate, and it dawned on me when I was 19 years old are you going to buy a house from a 19 year old kid? No, you're not. I couldn't compete with those bleach blonde, 36 year old, fine looking women that were just kicking my butt. So man, I started talking to my dad and said, I want to do this. It's not, not what I want to do. I need to go. Uh, I want to go to Texas A&M and study about fish. And when I get out, I want to raise fish. So he made me a deal. He made me a deal. Cliff Allen. And this is where it hit, where your comment hits home with me. He, he made a deal with me. Uh, he had a, heart, had a heart attack in November of 1975. And a couple of weeks after that, he said, you know what? You, you go and you learn about how to raise fish. And when you graduate, you and I will find us a place and we'll, 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 we'll get a fish farm, buy one, build one, whatever, and we'll raise fish. And I said, you got a deal. And uh, two months later, he died of his second heart attack. Well, I kept my end of the deal. And it would be fun just to sit down and talk to him and just, you know, lean on him and just share a little bit. But, so I, I sincerely hear what you're saying, Cliff. I'd love to spend more time in the river with my dad because now Debbie and I bought a place on that same river five miles away. Can't wait to live there. Debbie's getting the house fixed. So, 
I hear what you're saying. Mike McPherson, I have five small spots of cattails in my half acre pond. What is a good plan to keep good plan to keep them thinned out to keep them from taking over? Is fifty percent a good place to start, or should you kill off a larger percent? Uh, I would take out. I would take out of the five spots. I'd pick out the spots I don't want, and I'd take those out, and then keep the others just in place. You know, because if you don't, man, those cattails are going to go nuts. Now, right now, right now, we're all at the end of the season where cattails are about to go dormant. So, if you're going to treat them with a herbicide, and I don't know where you are, but you better. Well, I do know where you are, but but I would hurry up. And get it done because once the temperatures begin to fall, the photo period is getting shorter, the plants have grown and done what they're going to do. They stop taking up sunlight, stop translocating, and the only way to kill them is to get the herbicide to the roots. So if you don't do it like today or tomorrow or the next day uh, before the temperature starts to go south, then you're going to need to wait till next spring. So that's the way I see that. Um, let's see here. Frank James, <laughs> okay, let's see here, Del St. Julian, upstate New York. I love upstate New York. Feeder questions from Philip Benefield. If I've established a just before dusk hand feeding time, do I need to adjust the feeder time a little earlier each week? No. Okay, do, okay. If, if I've established a just before dusk hand feeding time, do I need to adjust the feeder time a little earlier each week? And do I need to continue feeding after the latest bluegill spawning time if I'm not going for size? Uh-oh. Uh Something happened here. Let me mess with my computer for a minute so I can read this better. I understand the feeding. Okay, the feeding. Okay, I know how to answer that. All right, here's here's the here here's what I got for you there, Philip. Is you don't necessarily need to adjust the feeding time a little at a time. Those fish are conditioned to that feeder going off whatever time it is. It doesn't matter. If you change it a little bit at a time back, if you back it up an hour, then it's going to take them a few days to adjust to that. And if you back it up an hour again, then it's going to take them a little bit of time to get adjusted to that. So what you should do is just leave it where the time is, and if you want to adjust it once, adjust it once. Now, um, and do you need to continue feeding after the... Yes, I would go ahead and feed after the la the latest bluegill spawning time because uh, after fish spawn, they've got to get their bodies back into good condition, and they're going to go into the winter. So I would feed them all the way up until they stop eating. Now, once they stop eating, and you're not worried about trying to grow big fish, if you're not worried about trying to get fish to a size... Then when they stop actively feeding, when the water temperature hits the low 50s, that's when I just let the feeder run out and don't feed them anymore until spring. Okay, let me see what else. Make sure I'm not missing anything here. Okay. Coming down, looking at these questions again, making sure I'm not missing something. Billy Bates, right on. I have several of those forages mentioned. Need the white suckers for sure. Our climate is very similar to much of North Carolina here on the Chesapeake. Yeah, I could, I could see that. I could sure see that. So I, I and you might talk to David Beasley. Dave Beasley works with Solitude Lake Management out of Virginia Beach, Virginia, and he's the one that figured out how to raise white suckers up at Savannah Dew, a private uh, retreat that I was working at back in the uh, 2004, 5, 6 span. And he's the one that did that, and he's he's now their lead fisheries biologist. He he could help answer that. Nick Allen, Nick Allen from Indiana, if I remember right. What's your thought on transporting large bluegill from one pond or lake to another? Safety transplanted or transported with aeration in the fall months. Also, would they spawn the following spring? You know, I'm I've never been a giant fan of moving fish from one pond to another because they grew up in that pond and there's not a lot of assurance that they're going to continue to thrive in that one. Now with bluegill, I'm a little less hesitant. Uh, with bass, I'm real hesitant. Uh, with bait fish, I'm a little more hesitant. Interestingly enough, there's going to be an article in the next issue of Pond Boss about that very topic in the November, December issue coming up. So I'm going to give you a direct answer. I don't really have an issue of transporting large bluegill from one pond or a lake to another. 
I don't have that. The issue that I've got is if you do it in the fall, that's the best time to do it. But those fish need to be in really good shape because what you're going to do is take them out of an environment that they've conditioned to and put them into another one that's going to be a transition for them. So if they're not in real good shape, you know, broad shoulders, deep belly, good body condition, then they can deteriorate over the winter in that pond. Uh, and if, if they're not in the greatest shape, then I think I'd wait and do it later on, do it in the spring. It's seven o'clock. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a minute and, uh, I always want to thank our sponsors. We've got several great sponsors. David Schneiderman. Uh, as a matter of fact, Leanne told me that David's going to send some goodies that we can give away in our drawings. So that sounds like a pretty cool deal. I can't wait to see what that's about. Uh, Easy Docs of Texas. Check them out. David Schneiderman. Friend him here on Facebook. And then go ch check out his website. They've got some very, very cool stuff. Perfect for ponds and lakes. Uh, Purina Mills. Uh, good gosh, I got to talk to Mark Griffin not long ago. He's the guy that was working for Purina back then in the like 2005, 6, 7, 8, and that revamped all the Aquamax fish foods and created Aquamax largemouth. And it's just great to work with Purina Mills because they're so consumer oriented. They want to create the best fish foods. You know, I get a little bent out of shape with them a little time sometimes on distribution, but that's not always their fault. Sometimes that's the dealer's fault. So I, I love Purina Mills' products. Uh, and I still go to bat for them, and I will. Uh, Texas Hunter Products. I'm hoping that Chris Blood's checking in later on today. Uh, Texas Hunter Products, my favorite thing about them is not only do they have great fish feeders, and their products are, are fantastic. They're made in, in San Antonio, you know, and their customer service cannot be beat. If I place an order for a feeder before 2 o'clock that day, it goes out that day. You know, so I, I just love that. Love it, love it, love it, love it. So without those sponsors, you know, it'd be kind of hard to put this show on. We'd still do it, but I'm so glad that they believe in it. They believe in my show. They believe in what I'm telling you, and I believe in them, and I do appreciate that. So let me see here. Palm Boss Magazine. Here's the newest one right there. Check that out. Look at the kids jumping off the dock. One last, one last fling, one last swing into the pond. And uh, those are my grandkids. <laughs> you know, since I own the magazine and I publish it and I edit it, you know, I, I get to pick out the cover. Well, there it is right there. Uh, $35 a year. Cheaper than a Friday night date, and it lasts a year. There's all kinds of great topics. I mean, everybody that I talk to, one of my favorite, favorite quotes was uh, a guy, gosh, probably 25 years ago. He says, you know, Bob, he says, I... Sometimes I, I think I'm going to let my subscription to Palm Boss lapse because I think I know enough about my pond. He says, but dadgummit, every time I get a copy of the magazine, I get at least one good nugget that I can use. And I just love that. And it, I tell you what, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Uh, there's a really cool photograph you're going to want to see in this one where Gil Lackey wrote a story. He just bought a place, got a pond. He's an outdoor writer. So he's, he's, he's getting to talk about his experiences and write about it in, a, in an outstanding way. Um, building Lake Deanna, that, that lake was pretty dadgum fun. Too much of a good thing with the fish professor. Also, I think in this, this one, we talk about, you know how we always talk about overcrowded bass and what to do about that? Well, Dr. Wes Neal wrote about that in here. Sometimes having overcrowded bass is a good thing, and he talks about why it is. All right, let's see here. Frank James, forage fish question. If you add golden shiners to threadfin shad, would it take the pressure off threadfin shad and help them survive predation? Um, not directly. What helps them survive predation is having everything threadfin shad need. Threadfin shad are filter feeders. They need fertile water. So if you've got a good food chain, then they're gonna their survival rates are going to be high. They need spawning habitat. Threadfin shad spawn on at about 30 minutes before daylight until about... 30 or 45 minutes after the sun comes up and they stick their eggs around the perimeter of a lake or a pond on vegetation. So if you've got good spawning habitat for them and you've got fertile water, then their, their survival rates are going to be better. Golden shiners are not going to make that better. If you don't have those things, then it doesn't matter whether you have golden shiners or not. The other thing about threadfin shad that you need to know is threadfin shad's primary role in a fishery, especially in a trophy bass fishery, is to feed the intermediate-sized bass. That's what threadfin shad do. 
Very, very rarely will a trophy bass go up and eat threadfin shad, but those 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 inch bass will. And, and one of the things I learned the hard way about trying to grow trophy fish is you've got two, two jobs. This is a big deal. The trophy bass question a while ago, this is something I didn't say, but this is a real important thing to know about trophy bass. You've got to get your bass from zero to 17 and a half inches as fast as possible. And they tend to crowd up at 10 to 12 inches long. The longer they sit at that 10 to 12 inch length, the, the harder, the odds are higher that they won't make it to trophy status. You know, that's why it's, that's why we tell people after the third year, start culling some bass. Be picky, you know, cull, cull the bass according to their body condition as well as their length. You know, but threadfin shad are going to be that part of the food chain in the open water niche primarily that is going to take those 10, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 inch, 13, up to 15 inch bass up to the next level and get them boosted up to 16 inches. Once a bass hits 16 inches, it can eat a 9 or 10 inch bass. You know, once it hits 17 and a half inches, which is about 3 pounds, that's when they can start eating an 8 or 9 inch shad or a, or a, or a, or a 10 inch bass. You know, so the food changes. When those bass are small, those, those intermediate sized bass, when they go from fingerlings up to that 17 and a half inches, they're feeding in this part of the food chain, which is primarily small bait fish. You know, it's little bitty bluegills, medium sized bluegills, threadfin shad. But once a bass hits about three pounds, three and a quarter pounds, 17 and a half inches, 18 inches, then it turns around and starts eating bigger, bigger food bites, starts eating bigger bluegills, bigger shad bigger bass. And so when you're managing for trophy bass, you got to be thinking about providing the food chain, not only to, to give the boost to those young fish to get bigger, to get into that class to where they can turn around and eat their cousins. You know, so that's the way that that works. And that's kind of a hard thing to do if you're not paying attention to it. That's why I tell people, weigh and measure your fish. Use the smart fish app. You know, judge the fish's body condition. If you can do that, then your odds of growing more trophy bass are going to go up. You know, you're going to grow a few trophy bass. Even, you know, what's that phrase? Of, even a blind hog finds an acorn. Well, even a bass finds its food and can jump up there and grow. And you can grow one or two. But if you want to grow multiples, then you got to figure out how to, how to manage that forage fish game. But Frank, to answer your question even more directly, the golden shiners live in a different niche. They're more littoral zone fish, even though they travel in schools. The reason they can survive so well is they're so quick. You know, they're so quick, they can dart, and they can see, they can, they see things coming, and they can escape. You know, now when bass gang up on them and start to feed on them, uh, it can be a frenzy. You know, and plus another thing that, uh, now where golden shiners could take a little pressure off is in the fall when the temperature drops, threadfin shad get sluggish when the temperature gets down into the 40s. They die at 42, but when it gets down into the upper 40s, they start to move slower, and that's when bass can really start to gorge on them, although bass are moving slower in the 40s as well. Chad Roberts, living in the north Ohio, do you recommend storing a Texas hunter feeder in a garage all winter or leaving it out and keeping it running empty once a day to keep everything running? I like to leave it running. But I tell you what, why don't, let's pose that question if Chris Blood comes on. Let's let Chris take that one. But uh, what I do is keep it running, you know, because w one of the recommendations used to be, I haven't heard this recommendation in years, but was take the battery out and put the battery in the freezer. Well, heck, it's going to freeze in Ohio. So uh, I don't know of any, uh, of any bad uh, reasons to, uh, to not let it just run empty. I let all mine run empty. The only thing that happens sometimes is, you know, a battery's got a lifespan and that lifespan can end up going quicker if you don't take it out and store it. Now, if I was going to do something with my Texas Hunter feeders and quit feeding for a few months, I think I'd take the timer out and I'd take the, the uh, battery out and I'd put the battery in the freezer and I'd take the timer in, but I leave mine running and I don't know why you couldn't as well, but that would be a good question to ask Chris Blood. Christopher Aguilard, most of us grew up like that. Kind of sad the new generation won't learn, the, won't learn the struggles that taught us. Boy, that's the truth. Yep, all right. <laughs> Travis was born in August of 1969. Andy Eddings, thanks for the kind words. I think about that every once in a while. 
You know, the, the, the bad thing in about not having your dad, my dad died when I was 20. Oh, um, not, yeah, yeah, I wasn't quite 21. I was 20. Yeah, I was 20 when he died. Um, is not, is not being able to have that mentor, but other, other men stepped up. You know, the, the good thing is I didn't have to listen to his criticism. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't have said that, but it's true. Um, and I do think he'd be pleased. I'll ask him one of these days. Hello, Bob. I'm contemplating Michael Gregory here. Todd Austin, good to see Todd. Uh, I'm contemplating adding 150 pounds of jumbo golden shiners to a 10-acre bass lake near Weatherford. I'm currently planning to put 75 pounds in next week and 75 pounds in March, April. My thoughts are that I will have somewhat decent survival through, it says see more, through winter, and those shiners will definitely hit the first spawn. The secondary stocking in the spring is to hopefully get the first and subsequent spawns. Like a farmer, I'm trying to spread out the risk of when I'm adding these shiners. Does this logic make sense? What would you do? That logic makes great sense. Now, here's here's what people don't know. We don't know what we don't know. Is in that in that right, Dave Weber? We don't know what we don't know. Golden shiners are going to spawn within about a two to three week window in the spring. If you can get your order placed and get those fish delivered before they spawn that first spawn, you're going to get a better spawn. Now, they don't throw all their eggs with that first spawn typically, but they're going to spawn 75 or 80% of their eggs. Now, here's the caveat. You need to be talking to your supplier about that now because when those golden shiners get real eggy, they don't like to transport them because their mortality rates go up because those fish stress easier because they're so close to spawning. So there's what you don't know. So it might be smarter to get them in uh, early March than wait until April. You know, so talk with your supplier, whoever you're going to buy those fish from, and see what it would take to get them. So, yes, I think that's great logic. The 75 pounds you put in, who knows what's going to happen to them over the next six months? Nobody. Are they all going to get eaten? Maybe so, maybe no. And if they don't, and they've got their right habitat and the right food chain, then they'll thrive and they'll have babies. Now, also, you got to know how golden shiners spawn. They, too, stick their eggs on grassy substrate. So if you've got grassy substrate, then you're going to enhance the ability to for them to be able to reproduce, plus for the eggs to hatch, plus for some babies to survive if you've got fertile enough water when they spawn. So that's what I was talking about. When all this stuff ties together, then you get a great result because that's the consequences of all these things coming together. So pond management is, is a matter of having the right infrastructure, the right habitat, then the right environment in that climate for those fish to be able to do what they do the best, which it's easy to sit here and say that. It's hard to do. You know, so what that means is you got to be paying attention to your water color. You got to be checking your temperature, weigh and measure some fish, monitor body condition, make sure that your forage fish are thriving. If your habitat's deteriorating, fix it. You know, add something to it. You know, and so I to tell you what, if you guys, you, you folks that don't subscribe to Pond Boss, you need to. And I'm not just going to sit here and try to hawk a magazine, but what I'm going to tell you is the next issue of this magazine has got three separate articles that talk about the consequences of not having a complete habitat environment for your ponds. And almost everybody that works on habitat after the fact does it in the winter because it's cool, it's easier to handle brush, cedar trees, whatever. And if you if you take a look at this next issue, the November, December one, you're going to see three articles in there that are significant to give you some good ideas. That's my hardcore sales pitch for the night, except... Except for the Institute of Higher Pondology. If I don't talk about that, Chris Blood's going to throttle me. And so will Danny Mack. Danny Mack went through it. You know, uh, uh, the Institute of Higher Pondology, if you go to pondboss.com and you look at the horizontal menu, there's one that says Institute. If you click on that, you'll see that we have six different modules. Now, one of the missions I'm on here is Chico and I shot some more videos back in the spring, and we're going to add that to the curriculum. And once you buy into that curriculum, you get all the videos. So periodically, we're going to add more videos. So those of you that uh, that are that have bought that curriculum or any part of it, we're going to add videos to the different modules. And if you bought that module, you'll get these new videos as well. So <clears throat> we got some pretty dead gum cool videos coming up. But if you are contemplating building a lake or a pond 
or uh, and Trevor just went through it. Trevor, you can you can say something about it if you're up for it. There goes a raven. I'm in the mountains. So uh, I'm going to encourage you to take a look at that because if you're really serious about managing lakes and ponds, yours or somebody else's, man, I'd be taking a look at them. I thought I saw R.E. Thompson come through a while ago. I didn't get to see. Let me go. I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Let's see what we got going on. Okay. Drew Schmidt, I just subscribed to the magazine looking to add a second pond on the property here in Kansas. I'm wanting to stock something non-traditional, maybe walleye and smallmouth bass. What do you suggest for prey fish and habitat? I have several dump truck loads of brick and rock on the property. Man, I'd be using that brick and rock. Walleye will do fine in a in a in a Kansas pond, you know, but that you gotta have walleye habitat. Now walleye are not gonna spawn in that pond. So don't worry about that. But what they like is they like to come shallow and feed, and they like to hang around rock piles. They love rock piles. They like cliffs. They like abrupt depth changes where they can migrate up and down vertically in the hot months so they can stay close to thermal refuge where it's cool. Kevin going to stop feeding in Erie, Michigan this week. It's probably getting pretty cool there. So I'd say that makes good sense. Let's see, Ty Jackson, I've got a clean three-acre pond in Florida, tons of huge tilapia and bluegill soft-shelled turtles. I'd like to stock it with bass for fishing. Will they kill them all off? The turtles will not kill the bass. Now, be sure, when you Ty, when you stock some bass, uh, be sure they're big enough that the bluegills can't eat them. Now, tilapia are not going to feed on bass, I don't think, depending on how big they are. If they're 10 pounds, they might, but... If you've got big bluegills, you probably want to stock 6 to 8-inch bass or 8 to 10-inch bass. So I would find a local supplier there, depending on what part of Florida you're in, uh, and bass are regulated there. There are certain areas they won't allow anything but pure-strain Florida bass to be stocked. Kevin, who can I work with up in Michigan? Um, Stony Creek. Look up Stony Creek. They're suppliers and biologists. Dave Owinga is a long time friend. I met Dave back, good gosh, 1993, 94 through there somewhere. They're real good. Uh, good to see Chuck Brinkman. Danny Mack, will bluegills and bass bite better if I deny, deny the feed for some days? You know, that's an, that's an age-old question. The answer is yes. You know, if, if you cut the feeder off and they're hungry, you're more likely to get bites. But the problem is, is you got to know where they are. <laughs> you know, you got to go find them. I know there's been, there's been a number of times I would cut the feeder off if I knew I was going to have an event at the house and I wanted people to catch fish off the dock. I'd turn the feeder off and you could catch them off the dock. You know, and so, uh, so the answer to that is yes, but I wouldn't leave the feeder off very long. There it is, R.E. Thompson. There he is. Made it out early tonight. Bob, what's the value of having lime sprayed from a truck rather than using a float to disperse over the lake? I know we're trading the bottom of the lake and not the water. Is it better than none? It is better than none. Hello, Ron Ardouin. Um, uh, the thing about lime is it's not so much that you want to cover the entire bottom of the lake. It's you want to get it to dissolve into the water. So if you can put piles of it near where the water comes into a pond. You know, if there's a creek feeding it, that's a good place to put lime. But if you've got a spreader truck that can back up and just spray it out as far as it can be sprayed, that's a good way to do it. And some, you know, I guess probably the most ideal to put way to put lime into an existing pond or lake is to have a barge and have a front end loader on like a pontoon boat with all the rails taken off of it, pile it on the front of the pontoon boat and then wash it off with a water pump. That's a good way to go. Joe Sun Chuck, hope all is righteous. Are pine needles harmful to my pond? Yes. No. Yes. No. Let me tell you why they are. Most of the places where pine trees grow, the soils are sandy and don't have any minerals, and they're acidic, meaning that your water is acid. And what the pine needles do is when they hit the water, is they begin to break down and they have a chemical process where they give off tannic acid and they can lower the pH. Now, the good news is most pine needles can only take 
the pH down into the low fives, which is not toxic to fish. You know, so what they can do, the, the reason I say that they're harmful is if your water doesn't have lime in it, like what Mr. Thompson was talking about just now, uh, then you lose your buffering capacity. You lose your rollades. And so when you've got plant life growing in the pond, you're going to see your pH go up and down. And, and the more acidic the water tends to be, the more pH fluctuations you're going to tend to get And when if you have plants. And so when that happens, that can be stressful to the fish. So, uh, so in and of themselves, they're not harmful. They're natural, but they can influence the water chemistry. Drew Bachman, is homemade vinegar weed killer safe to use around the bank of my small spring-fed pond? Yes, because you're not going to put enough vinegar in that pond to have one ounce of influence on the pH of it. All right, Frank James, thanks. Your suggestion for straws, threadfin spawning habitat, really seemed to help my pond. That's good. Chuck Brinkman, other than shocking the pond, which means electrofishing, what would be a good indicator of a healthy fish population going into winter? I've been stocking the freezer with the catfish, hoping not to repeat Memorial Day weekend. Yep, I know which I know where you're going. Uh, Chuck had a had a water quality degradation issue here back on Memorial Day weekend where he started losing a few fish and he fixed it by aerating the water. But there goes a, another raven behind me and kids on motorcycles having fun. Um, weigh and measure your fish and compare them to standards. So a bass of a certain length should weigh a certain weight, a catfish of a certain length, a bluegill of a certain length. Get those standard you can find them on pondboss.com. You can find them in back issues of Pond Boss. Compare your fish. Look at them. Do they look chunky? If they look chunky and fat and they've got some body fat, then they're going to stand a much, much, much better chance to make it through winter. Let's see here. Danny Mack. <laughs> Five pounds of shiners lasted about two weeks. No apparent survivors. My bass just think bluegills are just spiny. <laughs> and you know what? I believe that, Danny Mack. I do. Doug Cusick, busy planting food plots and moving sprinklers, just showed up to listen. Welcome. Glad you're here. Okay. Chris Fragalar, got good news. My boss's boss is making him take us out to an outing. Got a trip to lead a bend. Man, that'll be fun. That's great. Uh, Kevin, Pond Boss Mag is the best. Doug, what do I need to do to sign up? If you go to pondboss.com after the show, you, there'll be a subscribe button. You can click on that button and do it in the online store or... You can call the office at 800-687-6075 during business hours and talk to Leanne, and she'll get you signed up. Let's see here. Yeah, Drew, that 15% vinegar with Dawn dish soap's fine. Let's see. Travis, thanks so much for your knowledge. You're certainly welcome. Roy Snowgrove. I don't recognize Roy. Glad to see Roy. Let me see hear what he's saying here. Greetings from South Mississippi. While feeding the other day, I noticed a couple of bluegill had an orangish growth on their scales. Any recommendations on treatment? An orangish growth. Oh, you know what that? I bet that is. Uh, I bet is if does does it look like a little bump? If you can catch some of those fish and and look at that, if it looks like a lesion, and if you have more than about ten percent of the fish that have that, then I would medicate the feed for the next couple of three weeks. Because if it's if it's lesions and they're red and they're uh, they look like sores or bruises, that can be bruises from banging into each other, but it could also be the spreading of a bacterial infection, which you could fix that. Yes, they're bumps. Okay, <laughs> Christopher Ag Aguilar just <laughs> hired Ron Arduana, cut his grass, but he didn't show up. He's been working at the refinery. I got your back, Ron. <laughs> Okay, if they're bumps, that can, that's, that's two things. could be two, one of two things. One is this is the time of the year that yellow grubs exit the fish. And they exit under the scales. And then they go into a free swimming state and go find snails. So the snails are the primary host. The fish are the secondary host. And those grubs, when they break loose, they'll come out the scale and leave a little bump right there. And typically those will heal up. If it's more like a lesion or a sore, 
then that's a bacterial infection. Now, sometimes that bump can turn into a bacterial infection. But this time of year, it typically doesn't. So unless you've got anywhere, say, um, more than 10% of the fish have that, just send me an email and send it to info at pondboss.com and I'll respond. Let's see here. Mike McPherson, will you be sending an email or a bill to let me know? Yeah, I'll tell you what Leanne does. And I don't know a better way to do it. She sends emails to those email addresses we have. But she also sends out four notices. Four. Four of them. She starts about four issues before your your uh, subscription expires. Then two issues. Then one issue. And then one issue after it expires. And then we're done. Because we figure if we're going to mail four times at 90 cents a letter or whatever the hell it costs, then that's enough. <laughs> Jeb Kaufman, looking to add bluegill and largemouth bass in the pond next week. Should I release in different locations near the feeder? Uh, Jeb sent me an email earlier today talking about uh, hybrid bluegill compared to coppernose bluegill. And this pond is in southeast Kansas. <clears throat> and what I told Jeb was to, um, and he's, he's got a gift certificate from, a, from a, a, one of the companies that hauls fish to feed stores. And in his gift certificate, it says coppernose bluegill or hybrid bluegill. Well, hybrid bluegill don't reproduce much. They do a little bit, but not enough to support a bass fishery. Uh, Coppernose bluegill, though, I, I don't know that they would live in, in, in southeastern Kansas. Now, that particular fish truck, they know that. Those people know that. So I'd be surprised if they're actually bringing coppernose bluegill, pure strain coppernose bluegill, to southeastern Kansas. If they bring some coppernose bluegill that have been crossed with native bluegills or northern strains of bluegills, then they'll do fine. So since you're going to be stocking those fish, you're saying, where, where should I turn them loose? I would turn them loose just in one spot. Whatever's the easiest to access, especially if it's a new pond, there's no fish in it, just turn them loose in one spot. Be sure and acclimate them because they're going to come in plastic bags, float the bag in the water for just a few minutes, and then open one, and then double the volume of water in the bag with pond water, and then double it again. And then once you know the temperatures are within about six or seven degrees, if it's the same, everybody out here, if you're going to have a pond, you need a thermometer. You need to be able to check your temperature. That's a pretty big deal. You know, so make sure that they're uh, tempered well and then release them all in one spot. They're going to uh, be a little bit disoriented from being sained out of a pond, stuck in a concrete tank, put on a truck for five or six days, stuck in a bag and hauled to your house. So they're going to be a little distressed and be a little disoriented. So if you turn them all loose in one place, you'll see that they'll, uh, that now if they're shocked, you'll see silver or you'll see them laying on their sides. But if they're not, they'll be upright and they'll sit still for a few minutes. And then after they kind of start getting oriented, then they start to take off and go out in the pond and they'll do just fine. Okay. Roy, send pictures. You bet. Christopher Aguilard, I have a... Actually, I think I'm going to be going to Louisiana in a couple of weeks. So uh, maybe you can take me to one of your favorite boudin places and I'll buy supper. I have a resort with a pond as a customer. I may suggest they contact you for their pond. Sure. Just, I'd love to talk to them. We'll just, if I can't help them, I'll send them to somebody that can. Drew, when should I stop spreading Aquamax MVP fish food in my pond? I'm in South Carolina, close to North Carolina, not far from Asheville. Our forecast October 13th is in the high, sign in the mid 70s. I would feed it until they stop. And since if, if you're if you're using a feeder, just go out there once or twice a week, and when the feeder goes off, watch the activity. And you'll see. Like right now, when the water temperature is getting out of the, the upper 80s and getting down in the lower 80s in the 70s, that's their operating temperature that's the best. That's They're going to they're gonna feed like crazy to, to build their bodies up to go into the winter. You know, so watch their feeding activity. When their feeding activity begins to get sluggish, they get to get sluggish. Then cut your feeding back. Don't turn it off until they quit. Okay, so looks like it's about 729, so I'm going to kind of start wrapping up. Hey, 35 bucks a year. There it is, Pond Boss Magazine, living the dream right here. Go to pondboss.com, find the subscription button, click on that, and uh, appreciate you all watching. Um, the last couple of weeks, <laughs> it's been pretty hectic, babysitting grandkids so their parents could go on a trip, you know, and uh, – Roaming around checking lakes, and I think I did 4,280 miles over uh, an eight-day span and then drove to New Mexico. 
So I'm going to go hang out here, finish that book, work on those videos, take care of a few customer reports, and just uh, do some other things. I, I brought some wood carving tools. I'm going to make some Christmas gifts for my grandkids and some Christmas ornaments, some little Santa Clauses since Christopher Aguilar brought that up. Thank you. So uh, here we are, 730. I really appreciate you, everybody watching. It's always fun, and I, I, I love you guys. Adios till next Wednesday. I'll still be here next Wednesday, so we'll do this again next week. Bye.